Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. In the Inner Circle show several years ago, where political reporters spoofed the mayor and he retaliates with a show of his own, the mayor, playing a character, complained about the state of city schools. But you wanted control of the schools, an aide said. I don't want them anymore, the mayor said. That was a joke. The mayor very much wants to retain control of city schools, as Albany considers whether to reauthorize the policy first passed in 2002 to replace the Board of Education and 32 community school boards with a Department of Education overseen by a chancellor appointed solely by the mayor. The mayor said clear lines of authority were essential to carrying out reforms he said got swallowed up in the sometimes Byzantine world of school politics. He and Chancellor Joel Klein point to rising test scores and improved on-time graduation rate and the introduction of, of, of scores of charter schools into the mix of educational options. Now the experts run the system that educates 1.2 million children, they argue. Even the secretary of the Federal Department of Education, former Chicago school superintendent Arne Duncan, has endorsed Bloomberg's continued oversight of city schools. Lost in all the shuffling are parents. On issues such as whether the city keeps, it, keeps its commitment to limit class size, whether kids can go to neighborhood schools, even who is appointed the principal, the most important person in any school, parents often, com often complain they feel stiff-armed when they, when they try to express their views. Albany is now wrestling with proposals that could reauthorize mayoral control, end it, or do something in between, in which the mayor, could, in, in which the mayor keeps control, but parents get a meaningful independent voice. We're joined by four New Yorkers with varying views on the future of mayoral control of schools. Peter Hatch is the executive director of Learn New York, an organization led by pioneering reformer Jeffrey Canada, who backs Bloomberg's educational initiatives. April Humphrey is a project director with the Campaign for, for, for Better Schools and a critic of, of uh, mayoral control. Clara Hemphill, a former colleague of mine at the late New York Newsday, is senior editor at the New School Center for New York Affairs. And Michael Krasner is a political science professor at Queens College who is studying the issue of mayoral control. Peter, I'm going to start with you. Um, why, should, why should the 2002 policy be reauthorized? Uh, Bob, Learn New York is a grassroots coalition of 60 uh, school-based education groups, community-based organizations, and faith-based groups that represent literally hundreds of thousands of stakeholders in the New York City public schools. Um, and uh, the leaders of those organizations and thousands of parent supporters have finally seen progress in our schools. Uh, safer schools, better funded schools, uh, more certified teachers. Um, and this has most critically been seen in some of the neighborhoods that were most underserved uh, under the prior system. Um, and they believe that that progress has been made possible by finally having one person who has both the responsibility to lead the school system and the, finally the authority to do it. Um, and that now that we have uh, moved beyond the bad old days of divided authority, uh, a mayor and a chancellor who were often at odds with each other, a central school board often at odds with itself, uh, and 32 separate districts each doing its own thing uh, that led to paralysis. You know, we've seen progress, um, and we would like to make sure that whoever uh, is, the, is the mayor in the future uh, retains the ability to move the system forward and continue this progress. April, why shouldn't they reauthorize mayoral control the way it is? Um, well, I think, you know, on one point, I definitely would agree with Peter. I think that the changes that were made to mayoral control have sort of gotten us unstuck from some of the dysfunction that existed before. However, our organization, the Campaign for Better Schools, definitely thinks that there needs to be ch some changes. Um, the system is not perfect. We went from a system of, you know, uh, very decentralized control to a system of very centralized control. The pendulum has swung to the opposite end of the spectrum. There are no checks and balances on the mayor and chancellor's power, which means that parents, students, educators, people who are most directly impacted by what's going on in the schools have no voice in the policies that directly impact them. Um, so I think, number one, we think that there need to be checks and balances to the mayor and chancellor's power. They should retain control of the schools. But there needs the, the panel for education policy, which is the body that replaced the Board of Ed, needs to have some independence to really weigh in on policy decisions. And then at the local level, there also needs to be meaningful avenues for parent participation in decisions that directly impact them. Clara, you've uh, 
you've written about the schools, you've uh, studied the schools, you have two kids in, in the public schools, as do I. Um, the public advocate, uh, Betsy Gottbaum's come out with a report. Scott, uh, uh, Scott Stringer, the Manhattan Borough President, has, has studied it. And they all say there's got to be a middle ground. I agree. Um, I was on Betsy Gottbaum's commission. I don't think anybody wants to go back to the old days. I think there have been significant benefits from mayoral control. I think that, for example, the uh, teacher's contract with very much higher wages for teachers is something that really wouldn't have happened in the old days when the mayor didn't have control or responsibility uh, for the public schools. But I agree with April that the pendulum has swung too far, that um, autocratic decisions are made without any consultation. Um, bus routes get changed in the middle of the year. Uh, children get left on street corners in the freezing cold because the bus routes have changed. Um, uh, schools get closed with no uh, input from the community whatsoever. Um, arbitrary decisions about how children are assigned to schools are such that I know an 18-year-old girl who has a baby, she's in Sheepshead Bay and her baby is in downtown Brooklyn and the school system refuses to move this child. These are the kinds of decisions that get made when you have too much central control and I think that's the problem we have now. Michael, you're looking at this issue. I mean, um, we all remember the uh, kind of Byzantine. I think Byzantine is probably a good word. Mm -hmm. What's driving this debate? Is it pedagogy? Is it politics? Is it a little bit of both? Well, I think, Bob, it's a little bit of both. Um, in terms of the politics, once the mayor says that he's going to be responsible for the schools, then obviously he's going to want measures that indicate success. And the push on the school system to produce better test scores is, to my mind, a classic example of politics at work. If you put enough pressure on the system, you're going to push those scores up, whether that has anything to do with um, you know, improving what's actually going on in the classrooms or not. On the other side, uh, in terms of the pedagogy, I would echo um, what's been said. There needs to be more weight to educational expertise, both at the highest level in terms of the central board having more say and the mayor having less than total control, but there also needs to be a lot more respect for and input from teachers and from parents. Um, Peter, what kinds of changes would you guys like to see? I mean, are there, I mean, do you, I mean, obviously you, uh, you, uh, you all have studied this quite closely, and um, I, I assume that, that these kinds of criticisms resonate. Sure. Our, uh, our board, uh, which is chaired by Jeff Canada, who runs the Harlem Children's Zone, uh, Sister Paulette Lamonico from Good Shepherd Services, uh, Reverend Calvin Butts from Abyssinian Baptist Church, and Rosanna Rosado, the publisher of El Diario, each of them uh, works in schools across the city or represents uh, communities with lots of children in, in the schools and hear every day uh, concerns from parents and other stakeholders. Um, and so they know and we at Learn New York realize this system is not perfect with 1.1 million school children. It's by far and away the largest in the country. There is a long way to go. Uh, there are improvements that can be made. Um, we uh, would like to see uh, also improvements to the sort of parent and community input uh, that can be made. Um, but feel that those uh, that what parents want, what we hear about in the community meetings uh, that we've held around the city, uh, our parents are most concerned about getting information about how their child is doing, how their school is doing, maybe what's going on in, in the district, um, but are much less interested in fighting out what's happening uh, up at the central board at the PEP. Uh, you know, they're interested in uh, information, access uh, to information, as well as uh, assistance navigating uh, a large uh, school system. Um, you know, more notice, uh, of course, of major policy changes would be welcomed uh, by the folks that we hear from, um, but a, a change that would essentially add, you know, more politicians or politicians appointees uh, to a board and, uh, you know, make it independent from the mayor, we feel would just lead to paralysis again. Um, it seems to me the mayor is a politician, isn't he? I believe he is, yeah. <laughs> We've noticed that. Um, when, you, when you talk about the past, the your past dysfunction, can you, I mean, does, is this a bottle that's now been corked? Can you uncork that bottle a little bit? Um, or are you opening up 
by taking some of that control away from the mayor into that, you know, into kind of recreating these competing centers that often had nothing to do with educating kids and with a whole range of other issues. I don't think that giving the panel for education policy some independence is going to bring us back to the dysfunction that existed before. I think what will happen is we will see uh, much more vigorous public debates about important policies that directly impact schools and children. And I think those public debates are important for the reasons that Clara mentioned. Um, many of the reforms and policies that have been initiated through this sort of autocratic system um, have, have missed the mark were well-intentioned but missed the mark because they didn't engage parents, they didn't engage students, they didn't engage teachers, the folks who were involved in implementing them. And you really need to have that kind of dialogue. Um, <laughs> I'll just mention briefly that um, you know mayoral control exists in many other cities around the country and New York City is has the most authoritarian form of mayoral control right now. Even in Chicago, which is most closely compared to New York City, the members of the board have set terms. In New York City, the members of the PEP can and have been removed um, at a moment's notice when they plan to oppose something that the mayor and chancellor are proposing. Um, we think that's wrong. We think that those appointees um, you know, were appointed because of their expertise on education and that, that, that their opinion should be valued. Um, right now, that body is a meaningless rubber stamp. Um, when she talks about Chicago, she talks about other other cities. I mean, what did, how do you look at that? The, well, first of all, there isn't a lot of evidence to show on a comparative basis that mayoral control um, substantially improves um, public school performance. But I would, I would also be a little blunter about some of these issues. The simple fact of the matter is that the mayor and the chancellor don't have much background in education. They've done a fine job in terms of streamlining some decision making. They've been very good about getting resources for the schools. But I don't think that their ideas about education are particularly well informed. And uh, a uh, April made reference to the Monday night massacre when the mayor pushed through his third grade retention. Uh, plan over the objections of the most qualified person on the PEP, who was the president of the Bank Street College of Education. So that's one example, uh, it seems to me, that illustrates the point that there needs to be more of a balance and a lot more input from people who do have a background in education. One of the things the mayor did when he, when he first took over in 2002, he abolished the 32 community school boards created 10 super regions instead of the 32. There was a technical thing where the 32 boards existed in law, so they had to kind of technically exist. And then three or four years later, he did away with the 10 regions and created 32 community education councils, uh, which is kind of the same thing without any power. I mean... Uh, the councils were there all along mm -hmm. under the, under under the, the 2002, 2002 law. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. What, one of the things that I just want to follow up to what April Please. was saying was that the... Um, one of the things that the commission I was on, the Betsy Gottbaum Commission, is recommending is that the uh, Department of Education undergo the same scrutiny that every other city agency undergoes with the Independent Budget Office. With other agencies, the Independent Budget Office has a chance to get access to information to find out how our money is spent. But the uh, Department of Education has been reluctant to um, uh, open their books even to the independent budget office. The other thing we're concerned about is that the uh, uh, contracts are approved without anybody knowing anything about it. It used to be that the Board of Ed would approve contracts in a public meeting so you'd know where our money is being spent. We're not asking to go back to the bad old days. We're asking to have a little more uh, transparency about how our money is being spent. Um. The bad old days were particularly bizarre because as a reporter at the time in the community school districts were, um, which were elected in, you know, where you had like three and four percent turnout. There was actually a base of power of the smallest minority in the city, which is called the Republican Party. I mean, they actually, they it's actually, actually gotten smaller. They actually, right. Well, the Republican Party has gotten smaller. But no, the, the voting base. Uh, the, the voting base. I think, yeah. I mean, voting is going on right now, and I vote all the time. I'm not even, I'm not even, and I have two kids in public school. I'm not even aware of when and how I vote, and I always vote. Um, is the fear of that system driving the mayor, or is it being or is it being used by the mayor? I can't speak for the mayor, uh, Bob. I don't talk to the mayor on this issue. Uh, I don't but, know but what the mayor's own, view is on in the, your own in in the way you guys look at this, 
look at this issue? How much of you know how much is well, is motivated I'll by how this. by by how dysfunctional it was? Our board chair Jeff Canada has worked um, running programs for children in Harlem for 25 years, and and relates uh, in anecdote. Uh, where for a period of about eight years in the late 80s and early 90s, there wasn't a single certified mathematics teacher in District 5 in Central Harlem. Um, and this is a community with powerful elected officials and where certainly, at least in Jeff, uh, kind of a professional advocate for children. And he couldn't get that fixed. Uh, he would go to the community superintendent, who he, uh, in the story tells, cursed him and kicked him out of the office. Uh, he would go to the community school board and said, oh, you got to talk to the, the superintendent. He would go to the central board. The board would send him to the chancellor. And you know, in essence, all of the players in this old divided system pointed fingers at each other and passed the buck. And there wasn't progress for the kids he was trying to serve. Uh, so fear of dividing authority and returning to a system, um, whether it has community school boards that are elected or not, but just divided authority is something that certainly animates our board members. Is the issue, Clara, divided authority, or is it um, access by more than one person, in your view. I, just following up on what you Please. said, I think there's no doubt that black and Hispanic children and parents were badly served under the old system. Um, the, the community school boards did not serve those kids very well, and mm -hmm. he's, you're correct that District 5 was a disaster. However, under, after seven years of mayoral control, District 5, I'm afraid, is still pretty much a disaster. Um, your question was about uh, the community control versus... Right. In other words, um, um, the fact that you have one, you have a lack of, you know, the mayor talks about he is accountable, but is anybody else accountable? Is anybody else, can anybody else gain access? It, it, it used to be if you were, as a parent, if you were unhappy with your principal, you could go to the superintendent, right. and the superintendent would have the right to say to the principal, um, something, you know, fix the playground, uh, wh whatever the problem was, the superintendent had the legal authority to fix things. Now there is no such authority, only the principal is in charge so that there's no recourse for parents who are unhappy with their principals. Um, um, please do uh, jump in, but at the same time, the superintendent had to respond to politically elected, a politically elected board that often was you know, I mean, frankly, I think in, in many districts, there were some districts that worked, but in many districts, pedagogy was the last thing on their mind. In uh, 1996, there was a reform that meant that the superintendents could be fired by the chancellor, so that in, the, in, in that interim period after 1996, I think a lot of the worst abuses of the local school boards um, were, were eliminated. You know, the really scary things where the superintendents would order their um, uh, employees to fix the chandeliers in their house or um, uh, babysit for their children. Those things were largely eliminated in 1996. Could they babysit for my kids? <laughs> that I think you can still do. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you look at what's going on in Albany right now, this is probably one of the most, this, you know, now that the budget is done, yes. this is going to be a huge focus, you know, along with the MTA and other issues, but the schools will be a large focus mm -hmm. around, around this debate. Um, lawmakers are seem to want to get more more parental involvement, yep. but they kind of fear reopening the you know uh, pulling pulling the cork out of the bottle. I mean, how do you see the debate working playing out in Albany? Well, I think a lot of the comments that have already been made are also on the minds of the legislators in Albany. Nobody wants to go back to that uh, 32 district system. I would say parenthetically that that system shouldn't be viewed as a failure of community control because um, the structure of that system was such that it was pretty much doomed to fail. You had very large districts, you had a very um, arcane system of voting, it was proportional representation, nobody really knew uh, how to even cast a ballot. So You had to number your candidates yes, one to exactly. nine. Right? So I, I, would, right. I would put a little historical parentheses around that and say... And that the, whole system grew out of probably the most profound yes. political movement in the city, right. culminating in the Ocean Hill Brownsville strike A huge conflict and, yeah. and this was kind of a way of putting the lid on that. Uh, so I wouldn't say that that was a genuine experiment in community control. It was, you know, it was taken over essentially by a combination of the UFT and the regular Democrats and the Catholic Church. They were the ones who were electing most of the board members. Um, 
But putting, putting that example aside, I think it's very clear from the comments that have already been made by legislators and what's happened at the hearings that there's going to be some move in the direction of more parental involvement and probably something like an independent board, the kind of thing that April's uh, been talking about. What the details are going to be and whether this is going to be, you know, uh, a process where there's a constructive debate and uh, some good decision making or whether it's going to get bogged down in some of the dysfunction in Albany, I think that's a huge question. Can mark. you do that without giving people other than the mayor appointees to the uh, PEP, to the, to the new, the, what is it again? I'm sorry. The Panel for Education. Panel for Education. <laughs> policy. Sorry. Policy. Can you do that with, with, with the mayor controlling at will also, you know, all the members of that panel? Are, we definitely do not think so. I mean, I think we've seen what will happen. I mean, that's essentially yeah. the PEP as it is now. Members appointed major predominantly by the mayor, at-will appointees. They can be removed at any time if they disagree with the mayor. And, um, you know, that's, that's the one thing that I think needs to change. And I think there is support for changing that in Albany and making the PEP a little bit more independent. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to respond to a, a comment that you made earlier about the, the mayor, you know, how the mayor has said that, that this system has led to greater accountability, um, because I think um, that's, uh, that's not quite accurate. Um, I actually think that mayoral control the way it is now has led to very little accountability at the top. There's no one who can hold the mayor and chancellor accountable. Um, literally, the, the way that you can hold the mayor accountable for his performance on schools is on one day, on election day, when he's running for re-election. That's his whole argument. Other than right. that, there's, there's, in between those four years, there's no way to, to hold him or the chancellor accountable for what they're doing. Um, on individual policies, and and I would just you know add to that that people vote on election day on a host of issues, of which education is one, but it's not necessarily the most important. For some people, it is, so it kind of gets mixed in there. And I think the accountability at the top is is really important, especially for um, you know in a situation where you have mayoral control and you have the mayor and the chancellor predominantly responsible for the school system. But I feel we yes. had a 30-year experiment in which there was a board independent of the mayor in the city, and it's regarded by nearly everyone as a complete failure. How and and uh, to what's happening nationally in terms of other urban uh, school districts you know, uh, trending toward mayoral control and, in fact, away from the Chicago model and toward the New York City model, as we've seen in Washington, D.C., and uh, what Mayor Cory Booker wants uh, in Newark. I don't see how the so argument... So you think that any, that any dilution of the mayor's authority through the central board, any opportunity for the, for the PEP, for what's, you know, the current state of the Board of Education, is, would dilute the mayor's authority so much that it could... I'm not sure there, there is, is a, a, a magic number of what the mayoral majority should or shouldn't be, um, but it, it strikes us Should the as, mayor, should they, should they serve strictly at the will of the mayor? I think the greater question is if, if you were to take away the independent, you know, take away the, a, any mayor's, he, whether, whatever he or she has, uh, you know, whatever the majority is, and create a board, uh, where, where the mayor, the future mayor, has a minority of appointees, you've effectively recreated the discredited board of ed. Uh, and I can't see how that uh, increases parent or community involvement or does anything other than recreate I, I think paralysis. fixed terms would solve a lot of the problem. Yeah, I, I think you could have the mayor uh, nominate or, or name a majority of the board, but if he can't persuade But that's not the proposal own, of April's group. Right, but uh, Betsy Gottbaum's, yeah, Betsy Gottbaum's, Gottbaum's group does say that uh, the mayor could have a majority of the appointees. However, a fixed term. Which a fixed term presumably giving those people independence to say what they believe without fear of being removed. Yes, which means they're appointed by the mayor, but they can tell the mayor, you know, this is really a bad idea. Well, the education secretary, Arnie Duncan, who is an appointee of our president, serves at the pleasure That's of the correct. president. Were yes. he uh, to decide uh, that he you know, was not able to uh, or willing to carry out uh, the president's education policies, uh, the, you know, he would uh, presumably Peter, step he doesn't, down. Peter, he doesn't, he doesn't decide post. what happens to my children's education, though. He's right. not running a school system. I mean, it's a very different... I mean, he's not a, you know, it's not a direct service. Plus, the whole federal government runs on the idea of checks and balances. And with mayoral control of the public schools, you have no checks and balances. It's all the mayor. 
No, I, I would just like to respond to what Peter said about our proposal because I think that the way that you characterized it as taking us back to the old system is actually uh, a mischaracterization. Um, with the PEP having some independence, that's not bringing back the old Board of Ed. Um, it, under the old system, you did have a Board of Ed. The majority of appointees were not appointed by the mayor, and that body appointed the chancellor. And the mayor had very little control over what happened. We're not suggesting bringing that structure back. Um, we're saying the PEP needs some independence. Um, the mayor would continue to appoint the chancellor, who would be the person in charge of running the school systems day to day. It's just that this PEP would be independent and would continue to have a say over policy decisions, which is currently the case. It's just that what the PEP has to say about it is relatively meaningless because right now it is a rubber stamp for the mayor's policies. You have a system of over, over a million children, somewhere 1.1 1, 1 something or other million children. And um, the idea of community school districts, setting aside the old community school boards, the idea of a, of a layer of authority closer to the, to the kids seems to me logically beneficial. For me as a parent, trying to get the, uh, trying to get the attention of somebody who's running a system of 1.1 million, it's a lot different than trying to get the attention of someone who maybe has, you know, 100,000 kids under their you know, and and your school becomes that much more. We went through. Uh, I have a I have a fifth grader and a seventh grader. My fifth grader is at the uh, center school in the west side, and they just basically kicked us out of that of the school building that they were in, in a process through the the CECs, which are the Community Education Councils. Um, Stringer, the Manhattan Borough President, wants to give those bodies more independence, increase the number of outside appointments onto that board. Is that another way to kind of get more people involved, or is it also open up the kind of Pandora's box that you're, that you're we're trying to avoid? Um, certainly the CDECs have a lot less power than the old school boards did, um, and I think we should probably give them a little more power than that they have now. The, I mean, what, do you have? I mean, do you have a view of, of a community structure? We would certainly like to see the sort of school-based and community-based mechanisms, the school leadership teams and the CDCs, sort of strengthened as mechanisms for community voice and community input. Uh, absolutely. And um, do you think there's a fear on the on the part of the mayor? Do you think? I don't know what you, I don't know. Do you think what the mayor thinks? But do you think that? the mayor is concerned about losing a little bit of control? I mean, he, he seems to be very resistant to giving up any of the authority, any of, any of the control. Why do you think that is? Without getting into the mayor's mind, what, what do you think the implications of that are? Uh, building consensus across very different communities, you know, in, in New York, if you're trying to address issues of, for example, funding equity, you know, can be very difficult. Uh, you know, and there, if you are trying to equalize funding in districts and you have to get approval from every community, you know, in New York with very different competing interests, could be challenging. Getting input uh, that's really listened to and taken seriously in policy decision making seems critical. I would add a word to that, if I may. I think it goes against the mayor's whole idea and Klein's whole idea. Their idea is a top-down model. They believe that they know better than the teachers and better than anybody how to run the schools and how to make children learn. And from their point of view, they've proved it because they've raised the test scores. I think that's uh, totally spurious evidence, but that's what they believe. So the mayor, as a businessman who's been enormously successful in a top-down structure, believes in top-down structures. It's, you know, second nature to him. But if you spend time, you know, in the city, and we, our coalition has held nearly 100 public events uh, in neighborhoods from Crown Heights uh, to Bushwick uh, to the South Bronx out in Elmhurst and Queens, talking to more than 3,000 parents. Uh, plus the conversations our board members have. Um, or if you look at the public polling, the vast majority of New Yorkers support continuing mayoral control. Um, and if you talk to uh, you know, a typical parent, they don't say, wow, what we really need is a greater voice at the PEP. We really need the PEP to be independent. 
They really say, you know, I want my school to be safe. I want to know my teacher. I would like to be able to get information about my child. I'm not sure who, you know, it seems like there's some sort of self-appointed well, One of the things I think well, that the you are. Excuse me, my yes, experience please. is different. I, we work with um, community groups, parent groups in Queens and Brooklyn, and there was a lot of concern among those parents about the mayor's third grade retention policy and a lot of opposition to it and a lot of dismay at the way he railroaded it through the PEP. So right. I, have a, I have a different take on this from you. Right, but this is a, I mean, it's a, a concern perhaps legitimate about an individual policy of an individual administration. It really isn't a concern necessarily about governance, per se, about, you know, a policy of mayoral control that was implemented, uh, I think, wisely by the state legislature. Uh, you know, here in this city and in uh, in other cities around the country. Well, I think it, I think it's a concern for for input for parents. It seems, oh, by the way, that I think one of the best changes that happened is that each school now has a an an individual parent coordinator. I know in both of my kids' schools, uh, we have a person to go to to kind of to kind of somebody to call just to find out. You know, find out when a you know when a school meeting is, or if you need to get a message to a to your to your uh, kid's teacher. So I mean, and I think that the schools are making much better use of of tech of technology. We have a we have a website at our schools. There there are there are ways. And now that I think might happen, whether we had um, a centralized system or not. But I do think that the parent coordinators in the school have been a, have been a very very helpful. Let me go to. Uh, let me start going to some questions. Tell us, tell us your name and your campus. Hi, good evening. My name is Tatiana Benjamin. I'm from Brooklyn College. Um, it seems to be generally agreed that you guys feel that we should have a system of checks and balances on the mayor, but I'm just curious as to how exactly does that happen? Like, how does the process happen for the mayor to have a system that oversees what he does? Since it seemed that we had it before and it was taken away from him, how do we go back to that? What would, it, what would a structure look like, well, the generally? The structure that we're proposing is that the mayor directly appoints the chancellor who oversees the day-to-day -day operation of the school system and proposes any education policy and reforms. Um, the Panel for Education Policy, which um, is the body that replaced the old Board of Ed, um, would uh, be strengthened and made more independent by uh, the members having set terms. The chancellor would not. Would they um, all? Would they all be appointed by the mayor? The the members would. Some would be appointed by the mayor, but a, a majority would be appointed by someone other than the mayor. They would have fixed terms, and um, and also I think important is that the chancellor would not be a voting member or the chair. Right now, the chancellor is actually the chair and pretty much drives the agenda of the PEP. The single most important thing I'd like to see is the independent budget office should have the authority to look at the books and see how the money is spent. We don't have that now, and I think that's very important. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good evening. My name is Farugia Santanax, and I attend John Jay College. My question is, how do you propose we evaluate a program like memori uh, the, memori the mayor's position? Because if you just have, are we just creating bureaucratic tables of endless and endless jobs, or are we actually doing something? Because I feel like what we're discussing is that we're f we're forgetting about the children, which this is really about, and we're just drawing attention to politics. Well, the mayor argues that what he and the chancellor are doing is taking care of the children and avoiding all the uh, what my grandmother used to call the mishigas, all the nonsense <laughs> that goes on around. That, that's, that, a, that's, that's a technical that, term, right? <laughs> technical <laughs> term. That, you know, went on around the schools that lost a lot of focus on the kids. You know, as a parent, I'll tell you, it's very frustrating to try to get information on what's going on in the system. So uh, maybe they're taking care of their kids and they're not as concerned with me, though I think I have something to do with the education of my children. So, well, I think this, this is a crucial question, and it's obviously one that we, we you know, it, it's a long question, but the question of how you judge education uh, is really at the heart of this. The, the mayor's view and Klein's view is that you judge education by standardized test results. Or by, or by, or by graduation rates. Or by graduation rates. Our graduation rate, I think, is pretty close to Mississippi's right now, isn't it? Um, but the, the other idea is that you judge ed educational quality based on um, trusting your teachers. You know, and that, that it is the relationship between teachers and students that's crucial, and that the numerical measures are at best an aid 
to judging how well that relationship is functioning. And I think this is an issue that has largely been obscured by the weight that the media has put on test scores and by the mayor's trumpeting test scores as the one and only measure of educational success. Um, I also I happen to think the most important person in any school is the principal, who I think, uh, in, in my experience, we've been, I've had experience in a number of public schools, you know, as my kids have moved through the have moved through the system, and you know the degree to which the principal sets the tone gets to has a lot to say about picking the teachers, and um, um, so I mean I happen to think that more even than teachers is that, is that the that the principal is the one who is in, who is in control of the building. Anybody else want one to jump of, One of the, uh, the major successes, I would feel, of, of mayoral control has been uh, the ability to devolve authority um, down to the principal and school level. This is in line with national education reform goals. Um, and Including I budgeting authority. Absolutely, yeah. uh, and with something that you know began uh, in in sort of a small number of schools as experiments in the 1990s here in, in, in New York City, and was wholly embraced uh, under mayoral control and made system wide. Uh, and is an example of uh, if you have uh, you know a central administration with the responsibility and, and the authority uh, to you know leverage to move a system this big, how you can take. Uh, a positive reform system wide in a way that wasn't possible in uh, under a divided system previously. Well, they certainly have the power. I always wonder if they have, you know, so there's a difference between power and authority if you'll pardon my old my old political <laughs> science background. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, good evening. Uh good evening to all. Uh, my name is Simon Chen. I'm from Brooklyn College. Um my my question ultimately is Joe Klein, he stepped into this position pretty much a relatively unknown person of course, really well known for being the lawyer that busted up Microsoft. So I, I just would like to know from, from, from everyone, is it possible since that we don't know a lot about Joe Klein and since he has not, you know, his background isn't really an educator, is that why the experts are always up at odds about Joe Klein being the school's chancellor? Very good question. It's, uh, you know, I mean, uh, is there a professional, you know, is it the education mafia that doesn't like you know the 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 idea that this outsider has come is coming and run the and run the schools. It's an interesting question. I don't think it's so much that. I think it's I think it's what we've talked about before. I think it's the fact that this is a very top-down system that has attempted to have very strong control over what teachers do in the classroom. And I think teachers and other educational experts who think that teachers are important uh, are bound to resist that. Separate and apart uh, from the individual personalities of, of this chancellor or, uh, or this mayor, certainly a feature of mayoral control in this city and others is some continuity and stability and leadership uh, at the top of the system prior to 2002. Uh, I think the turnover rate for chancellors in New York was about one uh, for every 1.8 years, uh, including uh, educational leaders uh, who came in, t uh, you know, as chancellor and didn't last, so that it's been a, a feature. If, in order to be the buildings commissioner, you must be an engineer. In order to be the health commissioner, you must have, I believe, an MPA. You must have a, um, a, a, some kind of a master's of public health. Uh, but you don't need to do that in order to be the in order to be the school's chancellor. You don't you don't have to be an educator. I, mean, do you have any I, I think it is actually required. It's just that there's an allowance for a waiver uh, from the State Department oh, of okay. Education, which is what happened in the case of Joel Klein. Oh. Um, yes, yes, ma'am. Hello, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Victoria Oyanura is my name, and I'm from John Jay College of Criminal Justice. My question is to everyone, uh, every member of the panel. Uh, the mayor has certainly made known his plan to run for office for the third time. Despite the fact that this idea is not popular with many New Yorkers, he has chosen to go ahead. So my question is, since the mayor, the politician, like you had said, would always do what he wants to do, um, how can we bring transparency? How can we bring this check and balances that you're talking about, other than debating here? Is there possible to have transparency in the system under the current regime of what I think some of you are calling absolute mayoral control? I think the question was how do we move forward, forward to get these reforms? Yeah. And Other I guess the answer is to call your state legislator 
Um, yeah. and who are now who going to are be now we're now making a decision it. on this. And they're going to vote between now um, and June 30th. So I think mm -hmm. that's the answer of how you move next. Maybe we should just outline the basic point. Even though it's the New York City school system, it is the state government that determines the structure. It's the state government, the state legislature, which gave the mayor control over the public schools. And if there is going to be a modification of mayoral power, it will also be done by the state government. That's, you know, that's because of the Isn't it basic by, it's, relationship it's between the city and state. It's overseen by a board of regents where I believe they have term appointments. I'm not, I believe the Board of Regents that, that doesn't serve at the, at the pleasure of the governor. That's the correct. So, um, um, and of course, New York City is a, is a creation of the state. This, you know, right. the, the state could decide tomorrow to do away with New York City. Right. So, you know, <laughs> you know, That's right. Uh, it's kind of like we used to, people used to talk about Central America in the 1980s, that America would do anything for Central America except read about it. And that we will, you know, all you know, we will do. We are totally controlled by Albany, but we have no idea what goes on up there. So we're very <laughs> parochial, sometimes to our benefit and sometimes to our detriment. Yes. My name is Samaris Brown Cooper, Mega Evers College. I just wanted to know uh, what role does City Council play in all of this? Very good question. Um, Currently, the role that the city council has over education is that they get to vote on the overall city budget, which includes um, the, fund, the operating budget for schools. Um, the city council does not have any power or authority over education policy. I, I had a meeting last week with uh, Bob Jackson, who's the, uh, the chair of the education committee on the city council, was also one of the... Um, helped uh, spearhead the, the uh, committee for the uh, campaign for fiscal equity, right. which won the lawsuit that got more funding, more equitable funding from the state into the city schools. And he's vastly frustrated at mayoral control. Also does not want to throw out the baby with the mm -hmm. bath water to go back to the old system. But uh, is very concerned that, the, that there's a statutory obligation to meet certain class size obligations and that the city will not be meeting that, and there's no penalty for that. And so um, I don't know if anybody wants and to. I think one thing that's frustrating for the city council is that they do have an oversight capacity um, over the Department of Education as well as many other city agencies. And I think in particular with the Department of Education, the Education Committee, of which Robert Jackson is the chair, has had a very difficult time um, adequately exercising that role that they have to do oversight of the Department of Education because... Um, you know, uh, as Claire has mentioned several times, it's the access to information just isn't there in the same way that it's there for other, with other agencies. Yes, ma'am. Speak Hi. up, please. Um, Ariel Zephyr from John Jay College. Um, you guys spoke about giving the PAP more independence. My question is, will we be here again talking about this system of checks and balances if um, they get too much power? And does giving them more power mean going back to the bad old days, in essence. Anybody want to? Uh, certainly, you know, the, our advocacy is, is out of the concern that, that uh, some of the reforms that have been proposed would throw the baby out with the bathwater, uh, and that a, a PEP that was fully independent would, in essence, be accountable to no one, because it would be accountable to, depending upon the proposal, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different appointing officials. And it's not really accountable to the parents and children in the school system, but rather to you know to individual elected officials. Uh, and it would. And you believe the system is now accountable to parents and children in the in the in the uh, school system, or is or is the mayor have some kind of diffuse political authority and political responsibility? But in, but in but in fact, what you're hearing here is that parents and children don't have. Uh, if if they can't be listened to, what is the what does that accountability mean? But I think we have to sort of disaggregate there. There, uh, you know, there there is uh, access to information uh, that certainly could always be improved in a system this big. There is the opportunity for input on on major uh, policy decisions. Um, but then there's a question which is separate and apart from that sort of real parent engagement at the school and community level from sort of checks and balances by other elected officials. Uh, and it does seem like I think know, there is, that I there think, is no uh, elected official in, in a city who is more accountable than a mayor, whoever he or she may be. But when you talk about accountability for parents and students, it's, 
it's there's you know a concern about larger educational policy issues is one thing that you know that's largely what we've been discussing, but for a parent to get information about their individual school and their individual. Uh, you know, what they're concerned about moving a school, about class size, that's, I think, where you have a lot of the frustration on the part of parents. And so that's where the accountability, there may be political accountability, but the, but the question has to do with day-to-day -day accountability. Is Some of it justified, for sure, um, but it seems that the, the solutions uh, you know, that we've been talking about that we'd like to see other organizations talk about are, you know, at the school or district level for that kind of information, for a frustrated parent who wants uh, to get a question answered. Uh, that's why we're concerned about proposals that focus instead on uh, more appointees from more politicians to the PEP, which seems disconnected and unresponsive to those legitimate parents. And the concerns. mayor is not a politician. Uh, additional politicians. <laughs> I, I would also like to respond. I mean, I think I have said this before, but I just, I, I think to respond to the initial question, um, I'd like to think that what we're trying to do is to, like I said before, I feel like the, the pendulum has just swung way far to the opposite end of the spectrum. And what we're really trying to do is to create a little bit more balance in the system of mayoral control so that there there is a meaningful way for parents um, and people who are directly impacted by the system to have a real voice. And um, that's where the checks and balances comes in. And I, you know, I hope that that would lead to a system with more balance and and not I don't we're not trying to bring back the dysfunctional system of 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 the old days yes sir hi my name is Kevin Peng and I'm from the John Jay College of Criminal Justice my question in, involves the working class family and their and their parents how would you encourage their input and their and their voice into this system when most of them don't have time to attend meetings it's very tough I mean, mm. you have a yeah, that it's it's a very good question, and I don't think there's any simple or easy answer to it. Um, the the organization that I work with is called the Taft Institute. We have a community leadership training program that works with parents uh, to try to give them the skills and knowledge that would make them better advocates. I think that's one way to do it. I think if you train people and give them leadership skills. Uh, they will participate more effectively. So that would that would be at least a partial answer. I think it's a very important uh, question, and I think not just working class parents, but a lot of people don't have working time parents, for yeah, right. a lot of people don't have time for um, meetings, and that's why we have a representative democracy. That's why we elect representatives. That's why we have a city council. That's why we used to have school boards, because we elect people who will act on our behalf and go to the meetings for us. I also think partly it's kind of like when you have one kid and you wonder when you're going to get a second kid, can you, you know, you have, you're have you so invested in your first child, can you actually expand, you know, your love for the second child? And you do. And the same point is at some point you have to make the time. If you're, if you're concerned about your child's education, as hard as it is, we all work, you know, you know all day and you find the time to do it. I mean, it's a... I, but I, I but agree, I, but, but I'm just but saying your, that we use your politics. Point is very good. We use politicians as a dirty word. Politicians are not dirty. It's it's elected representatives that we vote to do things on our behalf, and I don't think it's a bad thing. I think democracy is a good thing. Oh, I think that's what representative democracy is about. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sharice Blake, and I'm from the City College. My question is: um, You said that the superintendent had question, um, had power regarding schools making decision, for example, about um, if a playing ground needed to be fixed. Who took that power away from the superintendent? How 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 centralized that, are those kinds of school-based decisions now? That's a very interesting question because it. My reading. I'm not a lawyer, but my reading of the legislatures intent was not to remove the power from the superintendents and that was something which was done I believe unilaterally but that's by the why chancellor. that's that's why this the mayor was forced to restore at least the position of superintendent even though there was no more community school board because those jobs exist under the law right it's uh, our, our recommendations um, from Betsy Gottbaum's commissioner to make those uh, lines of authority more explicit so that the superintendent would again have some power but essentially what happened is the district offices still exist but the chancellor fired all the staff right. 
The, the general answer to your question kind of repeats some of the points that we've made before, but maybe it's worthwhile doing. The state legislature sets the overall structure of power. Within the current structure, it's the mayor and the chancellor that dominate. So any of the decisions on this kind of detail would come from the mayor and the chancellor. It's um, kind of one of the reasons, one of my objections to the 1989 city charter, which basically uh, did away with the real power of borough presidents was um, in a city of 8 million people, it's hard to get anything done. You know, a borough is, a, is not a very bite-sized piece, but it's a more bite-sized piece. And bringing, bringing uh, government closer to people is, in the best of all possible worlds, more desirable. And I think the argument in the, in the way that the community school districts worked is that they became less accountable because they were out of sight. That because in this city, for instance, as a reporter, you go into any other city, they cover congressional races and assembly races. Here we have 10 congressmen, you know, 60 assembly members, nothing gets covered. So, you, so even the press doesn't do the level of accountability that, that you might have in some other city just by the sheer size of it. And that's the function of representative democracy in terms of getting access on, on, a, on a more bite-sized level. So, yes, sir. Pardon my pontificating. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Brent Douglas. I'm from Mega Everest College. My question is, um, well, you mentioned earlier that the state legislator will vote between now and June 30th. If the state legislator decides to take away mayoral control, do you believe it will just lead to a snowball of um, uh, judicial actions, such as Mayor Bloomberg seeking court actions to overturn that decision by the state legislator? Well, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, just to respond to your question, I, I'm not sure that anyone in Albany at this point is considering right. completely removing mayoral control. I don't believe that that option is on the table. And the way the law is written, um, it, the, the law sunsets on June 30th, and if the legislature doesn't take any action, then the law expires, and uh, supposedly the system that existed before would you know, would come back. No one thinks that that's going to happen. That's why everyone's talking about this now. That's why the legislature is talking about this now. They're going to make some sort of decision by June 30th. Um, they will, you know, definitely be seriously considering reauthorizing mayoral control. It sounds like, um, as we said earlier, they are considering some changes to mayoral control um, mm -hmm. in, a co in the areas that we've been talking about tonight. Um, but that's all up for debate over the next couple of months. How much of this is tied in with the political relationships between now that you have a Democratic state Senate and the mayor was a mm -hmm. large supporter of the Republican minority, what's now the Republican minority, what was then the Republican majority? How, mm -hmm. much, is, how much is just plain old politics playing into this? <laughs> uh, it, obviously, it will play to some extent. I think it's... And it's a mayoral election year. It's a mayoral election year. Um, I don't think that the Democrats give themselves much of a chance of winning. Yeah, there might be other opinions on winning that. Winning City Hall, winning yeah, Grace Mansion. Winning uh, against the 70 or $80 million uh, plus the advantages of incumbency that the mayor has to, uh, to put into the, into the election. Um, but I do think that obviously um, if, if it was a Democratic mayor, there might be less aggressive uh, attempts to change. But I don't, I don't think it's going to be decisive. I think however, this is, it, however, it's, right. it's a big enough issue so that I think, um, I think the merits are going to matter this however, time. However, mayors, in my experience, at least back to Ed Koch, mm -hmm. were trying to get mayoral control of education. Koch right. didn't get it. Dinkins didn't get it. Right. Giuliani didn't get it. Right. Bloomberg got it. Yeah, Bloomberg got it. He had the advantage that by the time he came into office, everybody agreed that the school system was a disaster. So that, you know, that was hugely in favor of his getting the control that he got. And I think at the moment, the impression is that the system's doing better but there are these flaws in terms of, you know, too autocratic, too centralized, too top-down, not enough parent input. Uh, so I do think there are going to be some changes. Uh, how do you see it playing out in Albany? I think it depends how much things cost. The expensive changes won't happen, and the cheap ones probably will. Well, I mean, what would be an expensive change? I mean, you know, making into, I mean, the kinds of structural changes we're talking about are not significant financial changes. Maybe there's, there are financial implications of the decisions that they make, but I mean, is there a... Uh, well, the independent budget office would cost money. Um, you mean, well, having the yeah. independent budget, um, so you would want to see them require greater financial reporting yes. 
on the on the part of how do you see this playing out? I mean, you don't believe. I mean, do you believe there's going to be at least some tweaking, and which is of course a loaded word because you could tweak totally, not tweet, tweak. I'm not into <laughs> Twitter yet. Um, uh, you know, I mean, can you? I mean. How do you we, see it playing out? Uh, you know, we think the legislature showed, you know, incredible wisdom in 2002, did a very radical thing, actually, in changing the system after 30 years. Uh, we've seen a tremendous amount of success. Everyone recognizes it's not perfect. At Learn New York, we're calling for improvements uh, in the reauthorized what kind law. Of, what kind as of well. improvements? Go, uh, you know, actually, for greater transparency uh, and for mechanisms, at the, again, at the school and community level, for greater parent and community input. Um, you know, and uh, our, our concern is just that, uh, you know, if enough uh, parents and stakeholders, uh, you know, lend their voice to this effort, uh, that calls for certain reforms that we, uh, you know, we disagree with, we think won't. Uh, I mean, you know, Scott, won't I mean, uh, Stringer, for instance, is talking about modeling the CECs, which are now the community school district structure, more along the lines of community board roles on land use, which would give them an advisory role, not a, not a, not a dispositive role, but would give them. They would. They would be. People would be forced to listen to them, to go to them, mm -hmm. and to listen to them. Is that a an interesting proposal? Yeah. Absolutely. That, yeah, that, that takes idea. into account, uh, you know, uh, mechanisms for community input. Um, and, good. and I would just add, you know, rank and file legislators in Albany, when they're thinking about this, it's something that they sort of in the back of their minds have been thinking about for a long time. Um, you know, through the several reorganizations that we've had of the system, system and all the other changes that have been made, they're the ones who get calls when parents don't have a place to go now to get problems resolved. And so they understand organically that there are serious problems when with the way things I are. Just got the, I'm just sorry, I just got the goodbye sign. I, <laughs> I never miss deadline. I want to thank you all for uh, uh, joining me. I told you I can't keep up with the timing of this thing, but I do the best I can. Thank you all. We'll see you next time on CUNY Forum. Thank you. Thank you.